Well, today we're going to try to pull together two things, pledge dedication and the 500-year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. This scripture we're about to read comes from a passage I referenced last week where Paul, the apostle, is doing his own pledge drive or stewardship campaign. See, Paul was raising money to help the church in Jerusalem. There was a famine in the area around Israel, and Paul went to those churches all throughout Asia Minor to take up a collection to help the church in Jerusalem because of the famine. And Paul uses some tactics that I might not use. Now, who am I to judge? But there's two things that Paul does here that are a little bit arm twisting. One is that, that he reminds them that their gift is being counted and watched. And so, you know, you probably want to be generous because people are going to see this. The other he, he does, which is clever, is the tactic, tactic of comparison. He brings up the Macedonians, and it's like he's saying, well, I know that you're more generous than the Macedonians, and you're going to prove that right, aren't you? Now, I wouldn't do this sort of thing, but as I said, who am I to judge Paul? Let's read what he has to say. Listen to the word of the Lord. Now it is not necessary for me to write to you about the ministry to the saints, for I know your eagerness, which is the subject of my boasting about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that Achaia has been ready since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I am sending the brothers in order that our boasting about you may not prove to have been empty in this case, so that you may be ready as I said you would be. Otherwise, if some Macedonians come with me and find out that you are not ready, we would be humiliated to say nothing of you in this undertaking. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for this bountiful gift that you have promised, so that it may be ready as a voluntary gift and not as extortion. The point is this, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. As it is written, he scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for your great generosity, which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. For the rendering of this ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgivings to God. Though the testing of this ministry you glorify God by your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ and by the generosity of your sharing with them and with all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God that he has given you, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. This is the word of the Lord. So today is the 500th year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And it goes back to that moment when Martin Luther nailed those 95 theses on the door of the Wittenberg Church. Except now we're realizing that might just be a good story. There's no documented evidence that Luther ever actually nailed anything to the door. What we know is that Luther sent a list of questions and issues that he had with the Catholic Church to his superior, to his archbishop, as a dutiful Catholic monk, monk would have. And that letter was dated on this day, 500 years ago. Now, people tell me that theology doesn't really matter. But, but you're here, and I'm here, and not over at the Catholic Church. So theology has to matter a little bit, doesn't it? 500 years ago, a man named Luther did something, and because he did something, disagreed with the theology of the Catholic Church, 
we're here. When people tell me theology doesn't matter, I, I like to think that they just forgot that I spent five, five years of my life studying it and that I've given my entire career, in a sense, to doing it. Teaching people about God is theology. They're not trying to insult my, my life's purpose. They just they don't realize but Martin Luther believed theology mattered. He thought it mattered enough to risk everything he had. He thought it mattered more than money. He thought it mattered more than his life. Because 500 years ago, to have a theological disagreement with the church was to take your life in your hands. Luther rediscovered a truth that salvation is not about earning it's not about human achievement. It's about a radical gift of God that no one deserves, that comes through the cross alone. And because he rediscovered that truth that's right there in the scriptures, we remember every year what he did. And today it's been 500 years, and I've given my life, my career, to making sure that I do everything I can so that in another 500 years, we still remember what Luther taught and what he realized. We're going to spend the entire month of November talking about the Protestant Reformation and why it actually matters. Why it matters more, not just matters enough to bring you to this building instead of another building, but why it really matters, why it's the most important thing in life. But today I want to talk about one small area, which is authority. What Martin Luther realized, what he rediscovered, changed how authority worked. We don't have a pope, in case you hadn't noticed. I don't have a cool hat. We don't have a king. One of the consequences of what Luther did in nailing those papers to the door was that the authority in the church, instead of belonging to someone upstairs, someone hundreds of miles away, the authority is yours. You're in charge. Now that was the gift or the curse that Luther gave us. He put us in charge. Now, it sounds good, right? I guess Luther gave the authority back to the people. Sounds wonderful. But when you think about it and in practice, it's not always as wonderful as it sounds. An easy illustration of this is, and, I, and maybe I'm weird, but when, it, when we go out to dinner, my wife and I, Someone has to decide where we go. And the authority to decide where we go to dinner is not a blessing. I don't know if you have conversations like this, but it kind of goes like, well, babe, where do you want to go to dinner? I don't know. Where do you want to go? Well, I don't know. You pick. Now, I picked last time. You pick this time. Is that we? I don't know. Maybe we're weird. But, but yeah, no one wants to have to decide where we go to dinner. It's a burden. And... And that's true in the church, too. The authority, being in charge. In some ways, yeah, it's a blessing, but in other ways, it's kind of a, a job. It's hard work. A more serious illustration of this comes from the book of Samuel in the Old Testament. And that's right at the point where, well, God has freed the people from slavery in Egypt. He's brought them into the land of Israel and sets them there and Years go by and the people of Israel go to their prophet, whose name is Samuel, and they go to Samuel and they say, we want a king. And Samuel tries to talk him out of it. Samuel says, no, you don't want a king. The way this was supposed to work, God saved you from slavery. God should be your king and you are to be God's people. But the people don't let it go. They say, nope, we want a king. We want to be like those other nations we want to have a king, make us one. And so Samuel does. The first king of Israel is Saul. And if you know the story, that didn't work out so well. But yeah, people wanted, they demanded a king. Someone onto whom they could project their own dreams and hopes. And also, they wanted a king so they had someone to blame when things went wrong. And that's what Martin Luther took away from us. 
Luther gave us the burden of deciding where to go to dinner, as it were. Luther took away from us the pope, the king, the authority figure somewhere else out there who we could look to to make our decisions for us and who we could blame when things didn't go well. So I'll leave it to you to decide whether Luther's work here was a gift or a burden. But either way, Luther put the church in our hands. He gave the authority to us, the blessing or the burden that it represents. Now let's go back to the scripture. Paul had churches all throughout the ancient Near Eastern world. And in one of those churches in Jerusalem, there was a severe famine. So Paul took up a collection. Paul did a stewardship campaign to raise money to help those who were experiencing the famine. And he writes in this scripture to the church at Corinth, asking them to be generous to help this ministry that was in a famine. Well, I could see some similarities. This year, we're doing a stewardship campaign. And we're trying to raise money for our children's ministry. And, and I'd be surprised if all of you didn't agree with me when I said that the younger generations are experiencing a kind of spiritual famine. I don't think I'd get any disagreement. And Paul says, look, the fate of this ministry in Jerusalem, it's in your hands. It's up to you to be generous and save it. It's in your hands. Now that reminds me of a story which I'll close with. I have a, I have a Kenyan friend. He's from Kenya, Africa. He grew up in a small, poor village called Marera. He came later to America and came to the church in Upland. And we went on a mission trip to Kenya where we dedicated a church and a well. But now before we went on this trip to Africa, Jonah and my friend and a group from the church, we went around to other churches, other groups, trying to raise money for the church and for the well. And I remember this story so well that my friend Jonah told. Every church we visited, he told them this story. I think it's an African parable. He said a small boy came to the elders of his village holding a songbird in his hands. And he came to the elders and he said, Elders, I've heard that you are wise. So if you are wise, tell me, is the bird in my hands alive or dead? If you're wise, you'll know. And so the elders answered him and they said, the bird is alive. But the young boy clamped his hands shut, killing the bird, opened them and said, you're wrong. The bird is dead. The next day, the boy came again to the elders of the village, holding a songbird in his hands. And to the elders, he said, tell me, if you are wise, is the bird in my hands alive or dead? Well, not wanting to be fooled again, the elders said, well, the bird's dead. And at that, the young boy opened his hands and let the bird fly away and said, no, you're wrong. The third day, the boy came again to the elders of the village, holding a songbird in his hands. And he said, tell me, if you are wise, is the bird in my hands alive or dead? And this time, the elders really were wise, and they told the boy, it's in your hands. Jonah would tell that story to these churches that we visited, saying the livelihoods, the well-being of this little village in Kenya, it's in your hands. You can give them a gift of clean water and a place to worship. Well, the life of our children's ministry is in your hands. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the gift of the Reformation. We thank you that Luther rediscovered the truth that salvation isn't earned by our goodness or by our merits, but that it's given, given with the blood that flows from the cross. Lord, help us to trust in that. Help us to remember it now, 500 years later. And Lord, may we pass it on to our children and their children that it might be remembered in another 500 years. Lord, we thank you for the gift of the church. And though sometimes we might wish for a king or a pope, 
You've placed this church in our hands. It belongs to us. The authority, the blessing, and the burden is in our hands. Lord, may we do well with it. May we honor you with it. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.